Grace and peace you in the name of Christ. And, uh, well, literally, grace is with us, right? Grace Academy. And uh, great to have you, Grace Christian, with us today in this passage about what? The core of God's grace for us and for the world. John 3. And so for the text, I'm going to begin at verse 13. He who descended from heaven now is the one who reveals. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up to whoever believes in him that they may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn them, <coughs> but that the world might be saved through him. Well, I began with verse 13, and those of you who have a coffee mug like I do, that reads, I'm silently correcting your grammar, <laughs> appreciate that. Because gar in the Greek, like for in the English, is a preposition that kind of conjuncts. It is that which is the source for what follows, but connects with what's gone before. For God so loved the world. And so we need to look at what follows, but what preceded as well. To put it in reverse, as it will, as we look at the gospel in the nutshell, the little gospel. Well, this discourse of our Lord's teaching began with not the little gospel, but with a big man coming to Jesus, Nicodemus. Verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, an acron, means a pillar, or a keystone person, a man of the Jews. And he came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rebbe, the teacher. Nicodemus was big stuff. In John and the Gospels for everyday interaction, Jesus was surrounded by regular people. But here, as we say in Chicago, is a connected guy. Right? He is big stuff. At the highest level. Well, he was rich. Now, we don't know that from this passage, but later in John, there's an obscure passage after the crucifixion of our Lord and our Lord's entombment it says that Nicodemus brought to Joseph of Arimathea, and together they went to the tomb. Nicodemus brought 75 pounds weight of myrrh and aloes to prepare the body. Well, myrrh is still used as a fragrance in funeral homes, by the way. It's the basis for some of the fragrance that you smell as you come in. It's a sweet smell. It's very expensive. This, in today's terms, about seven to ten thousand dollars worth. And it's Nicodemus that brings it at that time to prepare Jesus' body. So he was rich. He was a Pharisee. The lay lawyers of Judaism. More on that later. And he was an acra or a ruler, a member of the, what was the Supreme Court of the day? The Sanhedrin, or some people say Sanhedrin. Well, more on that Pharisee thing. They were the lay lawyers of Judaism. There is a very strong tradition in law, <coughs> secular law, among Jewish people today, right? University of Chicago, the preponderance of professors in the law school are Jewish. The big synagogue 
right near there. There's a strong tradition that comes from this Pharisee thing. 6,000 of them among the people. It was their goal to further define the laws of the Old Testament. By and large, they authored something called the Talmud. It goes on for 64 and a half columns in a scroll. And mostly, they further define Sabbath rules. So, they said you could tie a knot on the Sabbath, but only if by the end of the Sabbath it would be untied. So if you're a sailor or a camel driver, depending on things, that might be an issue. You could, if you had phlegm in your throat, spit. Can I say that? Yeah, spit, right? But only on pavement. Because if you spit on loose ground, that was considered plowing and work. I kid you not. They wrote that in there. Well, they were sincere. The pastor who followed the uh, Christ, Pastor Johnson, often says that Pharisees were often sincere. And I think that's sometimes true, but they were sincerely wrong. And I think sincerely selective. You know, our Lord, when he'd go into a town, wasn't a couple of times he talks about divorce and writing a certificate of divorce because divorce was real common in those days. A man could write a certificate of divorce for his wife or just proclaim that he threw her out of the house if literally it was written, the meal was burned three times in one week, write his own certificate. And if you were a Pharisee, oh man, you could write an airtight certificate of divorce. I suspect that Paul's marriage, and I think he was married, ended in divorce before he was called by Jesus to be an apostle. They were selective in their harsh interpretations of the law. You know, we sometimes do that, right? Become selective in our repentance. I saved a devotion from years ago written by Dr. Oswald C.J. Hoffman. Does anyone recognize that name? He was a great speaker on the Lutheran Hour and a close friend of John MacArthur. I kid you not. He was on that show frequently and they were close. Anyways, the devotion is entitled The Cross for a Change. And he tells this little story of it. The particular devotion in it is entitled Real Repentance. And he says, I talked to a French priest who says it really happened to him. An armed robber accosted him on a dark back street in Paris and demanded his wallet. The priest opened his coat to reach for his wallet and the thief caught sight of his clerical collar for the first time. He apologized. Never mind, Father, he said. I didn't realize you were a priest. I'll be on my way. The priest was relieved, of course, and good-naturedly, he offered the man a cigar. No, thank you, Father, the robber said. I gave up smoking for Lent. <laughs> Often goes on to write, obviously, the hold-up man's Lenten give-up only accommodated his bad habits, allowing him a feeling of religiosity and continuance in his criminal life. The big man, Nicodemus, was full of religiosity, but he had an empty spot in his heart. He was truly a sincere Pharisee. I believe he came to Jesus at night, not because so much that, well, Jesus was, as they say in German, verboten at the time. Our Lord, this is early in ministry at this time, to hide his visit, but I think he was, it was honorific to do. It was a thing, then and now, that to engage a Rebbe or a Rabbi 
in serious talk, you went at night. It was a time without distraction. And you were taking it seriously. In those days, Dancing with the Stars wasn't on TV or whatever you're binge watching on Netflix. It was a serious time of reflection. And then he goes. And Jesus shares with him the good news that fills the empty spot in his life. That gospel in the nutshell, for God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life, the life of God. Interest. Eternal. But for God so loved the world. The motivation is God's mercy, not anything in us. The source. But it also connects with what went before. The lifting up of the serpent in the Exodus pilgrimage. The Exodus pilgrims had disobeyed God and disrespected God's messenger. So judgment came in the form of venomous snakes. And they bit the people. But it's also a story of grace. Moses, whom they disrespected, intervened for them. And God provided the remedy. The bronze snake up on the pole. And whoever looked then in faith was saved. Finally, it's a story about the look of faith. As the serpent, so much more, the Son of Man, must be lifted up. There's a dual meaning here. It points us to the crucifixion and to the glorification of our Lord Jesus. Kind of like the cancel here. I love that cross. It's called the budding cross. Thought about that walking our coonhound dog lady this past week. Some of the trees are really budding out now. But then Right? Jesus gave himself his blood and righteousness there for us, no question. But the ascension window just above. And our Lord blessing. Both the crucifixion lifting up and the glorification of Jesus in his ascension on high. See, the cross was not the end of Jesus' glory. It was the way of his glory. Just days before he went to the cross, Andrew and Philip were beginning to see Jesus as a kind of celebrity. And uh, they, they bring some Greeks to him. And in response, Jesus says something interesting to them. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains a single seed, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. So our Lord lifted up, Son of Man and Son of God. Why? To save humankind from sin and death. The answer was in the mercy of God. And as a prototype of our Lord, Moses becomes a vehicle to point not just to a bronze serpent, but finally to God himself come to earth, to be lifted up in his Son, for healing mercy of the soul, for all who look in faith. A person that's truly connected with the living God has a religiosity that looks to the God of mercy in Christ, crucified and risen. Again, I think of Dr. Hoffman in his devotion. This is interesting. At the heart of all true religion, is forgiveness. Real people, wherever they are, need forgiveness. Only the phonies and the fakers do not need forgiveness. In this real world, the secular world, no man or woman alive can be real without forgiveness. Everything else is finally a sham, he writes. All that pride, self-glorification, pious devotion, will treat forgiveness as an illusion and the acceptance of forgiveness as weakness. The strength of true religion 
that connects us, the word religion, he's riffing on that, we get our word ligament from that. The strength of true religion that connects us is forgiveness. <coughs> the heart of real religion is the cross of Jesus Christ, a real man, not just a little God created by his followers, not just a religious figure popping up in the pages of history, God's own son, crucified as a real man on a real cross, proving his sonship once for all. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. See, the gospel does not mean overlooking sin. It doesn't mean smiling and going on, I'm okay, you're okay, or making allowances for real sinners. But it means the true God and man came into the world to save people. Not just good people. Jesus came into the world to save all people, even me, and even you. Oh, Pastor, you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> yeah, you know. Because I found it's easy for those of us who are part of what we call the Evangelical Lutheran Church. That's the word for gospel. Angel, Eve, good message. It's easy for us to treat the gospel as some kind of starting point, and then to go on, that it's kind of left behind. Or it's easy for us as church ladies, or church guys, to somehow think that, well, we're past it. The gospel is good, but it's for those sinners we're pointing a finger at. The gospel is never just a starting point. It's the center, and it's always essential to me and to you. May the gospel live in our hearts and extend through us as we lift our eyes and see Jesus in spirit-worked faith, in and from this place of Concordia, that we might look and behold that cross of Jesus and the grace and mercy of God flowing for the healing of our souls and for the souls of the world and to the ascended Savior at work in and through us by the Holy Spirit. What does it say just below him? Come and see and go and tell. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.